Welcome, friends. I'm the Reverend John Parker Dennison, and it's my privilege and my pleasure to be the minister here at Roof, Bill and Sue's home congregation. We've come together this afternoon to celebrate the life and legacy of Sue Monfort. Sue's life touched so many others. His mother, wife, Peace Corps volunteer, grandmother, friend, educator, and much more. We're here to remember and honor the many contributions Sue made and the gift she was to her loved ones, and to the world. This is a service of celebration and memory. We come together feeling the sadness of Sue's absence, but also comforted by the beauty of her life and the knowledge that she will live on in us. This service is a time to grieve our loss, but also to remember and celebrate Sue and the many ways she made our lives and all the communi communities she touched better. Sue was a member of this congregation with her beloved Bill, and she lived our Unitarian Universalist principles with joy and generosity. And so we will begin by lighting our chalice the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, with words adapted from Reverend Mira Mikowish, Bill and Sue's daughter-in-law, Stacy, as she comes forward to light the chalice, I invite you to take a moment to honor Sue and the gifts she gave to this congregation and to your life and to the world. We light this chalice which transforms oil into pure light and warmth to remind us of our own living, transforming the stuff of this world into love and action in our daily lives. As we remember Sue, may today bring forth transformation in us and in our world from grief, healing, from memory, wholeness, and from celebration, enduring love. The purpose of a memorial service like this one is to gather the various threads of a life and weave them together into a tapestry or a quilt of memory. We tell stories and remember, knowing that remembering is a powerful act for those who are remembered, live on. As we hear and share about Sue, we'll carry her commitment, her love, her work with us into our own lives and stories. And I hope we carry with us her bright smile and generous spirit as well. In this way, Sue will live on in us and continue to make a difference in our lives and in the world. As we begin, please rise in body, voice, or spirit and sing together one of Sue's favorite songs, number 123 in the gray hymnal, Spirit of Life. Thank you. 
Thank you all for coming. It means so much. I would like to begin this part of today's celebration with a brief summary of the life events of Susan Louise Tengis Montfort. To her family in St. Louis, <clears throat> to her schoolmates and college friends, she was known as Susan, but later became Sue in her profession and to many adult friends. I call her Sue. <clears throat> Sue's father and mother met at a young adult church group in St. Louis and eventually married. A few years later, Sue was born and became very precious to them and to the rest of the family. Her mother's sister and her father's sister were both married but had no children, so she was the only child. And they all lived near each other in downtown St. Louis. When Sue was in fourth grade, her parents bought a modest home in the suburbs of uh, St. Louis in Webster Groves in a neighborhood that only had one girl on a dead end street who became Sue's best friend. Most of her parents' friends had no children, so on Friday and Saturday nights, when the adults played bridge, Sue would read in her room, and she loved to read. For six summers, she was a scholar camper and eventually counselor for a month at Camp Minnewanka on Lake Michigan, where she learned many skills, including how to sail. I chose today's closing song, Blue Boat Home, to honor Sue's sailing as well as a metaphor that it offers for her end-of-life celebration. Sue had many friends in high school and was very active in extracurricular activities, and she graduated from Webster Groves High School as one of the valedictorians of her class of 300. At Grinnell College in Iowa, Sue and I met in the choir and began dating at the end of our freshman year. She was active in many activities, and in her senior year, she was asked to be the president of one of the women's halls, and she continued to be an outstanding student, graduating with Phi Beta Kappa honors. She was accepted for graduate study at both Harvard and Wesleyan, but due to their financial restraints at home, she was she, was, she went to Wesleyan because it offered her a greater scholarship. Her father had a modest job as a draftsman, and her mother became increasingly handicapped by rheumatoid arthritis, which began shortly after Sue was born and grew progressively worse. <clears throat> I began my teaching career in a town about an hour and a half from Wesleyan and visited Sue on weekends. After earning an MAT from Wesleyan, she taught English at Tappan Zee High School in, in New York, and we were married during the Christmas break. You'll see, see some photo, photos later. We were both inspired by John F. Kennedy's speech and joined the Peace Corps in 1965 training at Teachers College at Columbia University, and then we were assigned to teach in Kenya. When the plane arrived in Nairobi with all of us volunteers, Sue and I were pulled aside and processed separately so that the Ministry of Education did not know that two experienced teachers, well, with two years of experience, but experienced teachers, uh, would be, quote, wasted on the wafts, waifs and street urchins of Nairobi. We were placed in a startup school for orphans, Strehe Boys Center. Sue taught English and history, started a, a school library, and began a, a literacy program for young mothers in a neighborhood center. We insisted on living at the school, which was in the slums of Nairobi, so that we could help wherever needed at our school, and we ran various activities, et cetera. She began the student publication at, at the school. We shared a two-family house with an African family with four young kids. One had whooping cough. 
and we were only a wall apart. Our house had electricity, but no toilet or running water. It was like camping for three years. We extended our stay to a third year and decided to have a child. Larissa was born at Nairobi Hospital, and Sue took, care, took her in a, her basket to her classes. The students and the African neighbors were very impressed with this white baby and very interested. Some African children thought the white skin would rub off. <laughs> when we returned to the US, I took a job at a suburban high school near where my parents were living. We had a second child, Timothy, and Sue stayed home with our kids while I was at school teaching. <clears throat> Since Sue had seen the impact of too many children on mothers in Kenya, average mother had 13 children at, a time, at, that, at that time in Kenya. She volunteered with Planned Parenthood at Baby Keep Well Clinics in New Jersey and, and took preschool age Timothy with her. When our children became more comfortable with their schools, Sue accepted a part-time job with Planned Parenthood, working at a center and gradually doing sex education classes at, in, phys, in phys ed, classes in schools. She eventually worked with other Planned Parenthood staff in preparing, testing, and revising materials for teachers to use. Her attention to detail and written expression was valued and her expertise was appreciated. Some of the books she contributed to are on display here in the gallery. When our children were off to college, Sue devoted more time to her work with Planned Parenthood. She established the Women to Women Peer Education Program in which local women from underserved populations were given family planning training and then reached out to their neighbors you will see a photo of her, that later on the screen. Sue was also active in, with gardening and quilting. She was a member of the Long Valley Garden Club and entered competitions with her flower arrangements. The flowers here certainly highlight that. She created dry flower arrangements to decorate wedding announcements for special friends. With several friends, she started a quilting group which would make squares and assemble a quilt for each member. The theme Sue chose was <clears throat> African animals. We moved to Ashland before her squares were assembled, so I asked Patty Dugan of this fellowship to sew the squares together. Patty did a wonderful job that you'll see here. On the back is a, a map of Africa. Sue made a quilt to celebrate my mother's 80th birthday and then her mother's 80th birthday. My mother's here, her birthday, her, her mother's there. She also organized big family gatherings for each of those events. She was a principal force in organizing special family holiday events. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, our son's wedding, and my retirement. To her, family was very, very special. We moved to Ashland, Oregon in late 2014, and soon thereafter, she began to show slime, signs of dementia and needed increased supervision, which I did with help at first, and then with helpful, wonderful, wonderful caregivers, and I'm glad some of them are here today until I needed to place her in a memory care facility where she continued to decline and eventually passed. Sue has left a wonderful and rich history of artistic, educational, and personal contributions to our lives and many others. We can all be very proud of her and thank her for enriching our lives. We have been fortunate to have had, I have been fortunate to have had her as my wife, partner, and dear companion for nearly 60 years.
So this is a collection of photos from various times in Sue's life. Uh, yes, she began as a baby. <laughs> okay. And she had proud parents who liked, who liked to curl her hair. And she missed a tooth at first at age four and received piano lessons from her aunt. Uh, the inevitable portraits, this is in 10th grade. And we, as you know, got married, and here we are, and all de decked out in the Congregational Church of Webster Groves. And of course, tossing the bouquet to friends and relatives, uh, including my sister and some of her high school and graduate school friends, and two remote cousins, and this one will speak a little later today. And of course, my brother is at the food table, <laughs> along with my uh, roommate for two years at six foot eight, and an immense appetite. <laughs> and then in Peace Corps, Robert Kennedy visited our school, and we met with him. Okay. And these are the, this is the family that shared with us. This is me and Sue, of course, and, and husband and wife, and one, two, three, four, oh, yeah, four kids. Okay. And the one with, I don't know, that was <laughs> on the other side of the wall, so <laughs> probably it was shared from one to another. And then little newborn Larissa with one of the nurses at Nairobi Hospital. And yes, Sue, Larissa needed to be changed, and Sue and I took turns. At Larissa's fourth birthday, uh, with, with baby Larissa, baby Tim, who was not very happy. I think he wanted t to touch the cake. And enjoying snow cones um, made from red dye number five. <laughs> that may explain why we're all short. <laughs> and then with friends uh, at, on the top of the World Trade Center, when it was still standing, uh, Phil and his wife from Malawi, uh, Elsie, and their two daughters, um, Becky and Susan, and Larissa. And raising golden retriever puppies, um, in part for fun, but also to, um, to sell and be added to uh, Larissa's uh, college fund. At Heart Lake, which is my grandfather's and grandmother's summer home. Uh, there we are in, in teenage years. Not all of us, but the, okay. And then an example of a Christmas celebration. It wasn't just for the dog, but, <laughs> but Sue and my mother and Larissa, me, and then my um, sister-in-law, Emily, and Josh who is here today. Sorry, Alex, you were miss missing from that picture. You're probably asleep. <laughs> uh, and then at the gathering uh, of the family at uh, Stacy and Tim's wedding. Um, hiking uh, ne near Mount Rainier. Uh, the graduation. Um, with the teacher and Sue and the students all dressed up for the special event. And Sue dressed up for some sort of special presentation. <clears throat> uh, Sue with her mother, uh, who had not only rheumatoid arthritis, but uh, eye problems and eventually a glass eye and loved to read 
right into her death, which was very, very nice. I don't have a close-up of her father, but he was equally fine and a great, great caregiver. So she had a, a group of six high school friends that would go on, on vacations together for a week each year. And here is Sue with some of the friends at that particular um, event. And then with her love of, love of flowers, preparing bouquets, et cetera, um, for Tim and Stacy's wedding. Uh, a Christmas celebration with a baby, with our granddaughter, Isla. And a final Christmas uh, post, Christ, post, post picture in 2002. Wasn't I lucky to hear that growing up? Yeah. Having them sing like that and yeah, singing lullabies. And I remember so many wonderful times of being in the car, going on long car trips across the country to different national parks. And we'd sing our way there. It was so much fun. Tim wasn't always thrilled about it, but <laughs> the rest of us love to sing. Yeah. It's one of the things I love my, about my mom was her musicality. And she played the piano and was just such a happy, cheerful, enthusiastic person. It's hard to figure out exactly what to say here, so I'll just share a few memories, a few things. Um, I really remember so much what a good mother she was. She was caring and loving and nurturing and made great food and valued family. We, every night at dinner, we would all sit down together and um, we would light a candle as a symbol that we were all well and there together and we'd share about our days and she'd share about hers and it was a great way to stay connected as a family and that really exemplified to me like her, her strong family connection and value of that, as well as how much she loved her friends and was on the phone with her friends and going on trips with them and, and keeping those connections going, quilting and, and other things. But what a great mom. I couldn't have asked for better care, really. Very attentive and present and, and helped me in lots of ways. She was an academic, great writer. She helped my writing skills and um, was always very interested in how I was doing in school. So, of course, I lived up to that. And she was very adventurous. We went on, we were fortunate enough to travel to various countries as a family since my parents worked as teachers during the school year and then we would go traveling. So we were really lucky we got to go lots of different places and she was always very enthusiastic and ready to go look at the next museum or meet the next person or look at the next landscape. And she loved the landscape. She loved the colors of the sunset, the birds, whatever wildlife we saw. Uh, was just very enthusiastic about the natural world, and I think that's one of the things that um, pointed me in the direction of becoming a biology major, just that, that awe of the natural world. We've already heard how she was a gardener. Another thing that she did is she would arrange fresh flowers and bring those in on the table, so we always had a little bit of spring or a little bit of summer at our meals. And in my eyes, she was good at every craft she did, whether it was arranging flowers or um, quilting or whatever she was doing, she um, always did it with flair and was uh, very artistic. She was strong mentally and strong physically, and so when we would go on family hikes, 
who wanted to go around the next bend. We were all exhausted, and she's like, let's just see what's down the trail around the next bend. So she um, was an adventurer and loved to just keep going and going and going and seeing what was next, which I'm glad because now I'm like that too. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Malta with her. I did a lot of traveling with the whole family, um, but I also went just with her on a women's trip that was uh, focusing on singing and sacred sites in Malta, so that was pretty special to um, go on a trip with her. And what else can I say? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. She really had an eye for beauty. She modeled for me, too, how to be a strong career woman while also balancing how to be in family. So she was, uh, like I said, did wonderful things around the house. She was very in tune with dad and they made decisions together and so they modeled a healthy partnership and healthy decision making. Um, and she also had this, this roaring career where she was very res respected and um, able to utilize her teaching skills and her, her brains. She was a very intelligent woman. So I, I was glad to have a strong woman model in my life as well. And the main thing, and a woman with a lot of heart, you know, the cat would be on her lap or the dog next to her when we were eating. The animals loved her. Um, so very determined, a whole lot of heart, very enthousi enthusiastic about life, and I'm just so grateful for her love, and I carry her here always. Thank you. And now I'm going to share a song with my friend Chris. Um, since I was born in Kenya, I thought it might be nice to sing a song in one of the languages of Kenya. It's in Swahili. And the, the title of the song is Kwaheri, which means goodbye. The, the sort of formal translation of the words that we're going to be singing is goodbye, goodbye, loved one, goodbye. May we meet again, God willing. And you'll hear that I've added some of my own words in there. And a little bit of the composition that we're doing is slightly influenced by a group called Labana, that, um, where I first heard the song. But it's called Kwaheri. And because in Africa, celebrating big life and death events and rites of passage is a community thing, I'll ask you to clap along at some point if you want to. So if I do this or Chris does this, it means join in to celebrate her life. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. joys of playing in a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> Tuki Jaliwa Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Mpensi Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Mpensi Kwa Heri Tuta Nana Tena Tuki Jaliwa Tuta Nana Tena Tuki Jaliwa Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Mpensi Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Kwa Heri Mpensi Kwa Heri Tuta Nana Harry, quite 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 Harry,
Hi everybody, I'm Tim. I'm uh, Bill Jr. maybe, look a little like him, but uh, it's all, I gotta realize I had a couple challenges today. One of them is I came to a talent show with no talent, but I, I could try to keep you interested anyway. Um, could have rollerbladed, could have juggled maybe, but um, I'm uh, 52 years old and um, I've had the, uh, the benefit of having my mom here for the last 10 years, which is awesome. Um, so around the last, uh, you know, end of last year, we had a sort of a small family gathering at a house in Asheville, and then we, uh, you know, we all shared uh, adjectives about my mom. So I realized as I was writing those how easy it was to write about her because she's got so many amazing things. But uh, anyway, I thought today I would share a few of those. Um, some of you know my mom really well, and some not so much, but um, it's always sort of hard to go in the middle of a program or later because everything's been said. But um, that being said, um, you know, I, um, one of the things I really valued about my mom is she was so kind and loving. Um, you know, to me, uh, as my wife, um, you know, as a grandmother to my daughter, um, loving the greater family and her lifelong friends, um, friends of ours, um, her parents and relatives, um, you know, my childhood friends, college friends, excuse me. <clears throat> but um, everybody really liked being around her because she had such great energy. Um, she's so positive and uh, uplifting. Um, <clears throat> I, I would say that she continued that on even in uh, her, you know, tr um, more challenging times in the, the memory care facility. Um, but, you know, just always this theme of high energy and positivity, which is great. Uh, you know, who wouldn't want to be around that? I can think of some exceptions, of course. Um, when we were younger, you know, things weren't always pleasant. You know, when my parents were getting screwed over by somebody selling them something, um, a, a friend selling Amway. Um, there's a lot, a lot of that going on. Uh, they were always easy, uh, easy targets. Um, and also, you know, being accused of her aunt for about stealing their silverware when she was aging later on. So that was, you know, was, we had lots of fun times about uh, you know, surprisingly amusing conflict, and uh, I learned a lot about him, <laughs> about uh, defending oneself. Um, and she was also the one that really taught me how to use curse words. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm probably the best at that in the family. But uh, you know, she was also, you know, a, sort of um, a, tough, a tough competitor and, a, um, you know, scrappy, and so I, that certainly um, rubbed off on me, too. Um, she was super compassionate, um, empathetic, uh, Thoughtful and intelligent, you know, um, anyone that knew her knew that she was really sensitive of our people, um, their struggles and triumphs. Um, <clears throat> she was always a super engaged and invested in her relationships with friends and family. Um, it was, you know, had a crazy work ethic, um, which is good, you know, that she was so um, passionate about what, what, what she was inspired about. Um, always quick on the uptake, you know, hard to, hard to cheat 
so on anything. You know, she was sharp um, and just super on her game um, about everything. Super appreciative of time with friends and family, um, people, phone calls. My sister mentioned, you know, I could still hear her voice answering calls from friends. Uh, she appreciated a lot of, like, uh, simple things, too, like, you know, simple gifts, <clears throat> better gifts, which weren't too often, you know, nicer gifts. But uh, any sort of acknowledgement from other people she was appreciative of, uh, good, good game, good food, good entertainment, uh, meaningful challenges, um, you know, animals, of course, my sister mentioned, too, uh, but also naps in the sun. And uh, life, life spent outdoors. Gardening, um, flowers, wildlife, uh, all the things that all of us enjoy. Um, but we could also really count on her for the things that were, my dad was too cheap um, to do or, <laughs> or not that much fun about. Like, we could always count on her for, like, edible treats on the way home from the orthodontist or the dentist, you know, that we're, we weren't supposed to have. Or, you know, snacks that actually tasted good in the car. Um, <laughs> She always had room for dessert. It was never like, do we, if we need something, do we ask dad? Because that's a no. <laughs> but there's a pretty good chance that mom would find a way into it. Uh, and I would also say like another thing I um, really value about her is she was so brave and strong um, in her choice of a career path. You know, especially coming from sort of a conservative upbringing and the, you know, the Midwest of all places uh, where a lot of what she did was, you know, not maybe not the traditional path. Um, representing Planned Parenthood at public events where I saw, you know, firsthand how awful people can be. Um, earning her choice to, be over, to go overseas at a pretty young age um, with a purpose. And just brave confronting, like, wanderers under our property in New Jersey um, or people cutting her lilacs or, um, <laughs> you know, and also facing the sad reality that she, when she knew she had Alzheimer's <laughs> and, how, and how that would end. But, but um... Excuse me, she was strong really all the way through, but sort of amazingly so. Um, so, you know, basically just in closing, I won't belabor it too much, but I definitely feel lucky to have had her as a mom um, and super thankful for, her. you know, what a great parent she was to me uh, in childhood and adulthood and just what a great role model <clears throat> she was for me as a parent and a person. Uh, I mean, there's so much to respect about her, um, and I'm thankful that, you know, to have all these deep, um, you know, long-lasting, fond memories of uh, life with her. And she was just a huge contributor to the quality and substance and joy of all of our lives, so, I mean, she'll, she'll be sorely missed, and she already is. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kathy Colbury, and I am Susan's cousin. I'm guessing those are two words you haven't heard together very often, Susan's cousin. We have a small family, and I always considered Susan a close relative, even though we eventually figured out we were only third cousins. Some people say that doesn't even count, but for us, it did. Susan was devoted to her family, even her third cousins. When I was growing up in St. Louis, Susan had already left for college and adventures beyond, but there was always a strong familial connection. We saw Susan's parents, aunt and uncle, and grandmother frequently, and kept up on the news of Susan and Bill, and then Larissa and Tim, and we looked forward to the Montfort visits. It wasn't until my adulthood, though, that something wonderful happened. I began to know Susan and Bill as friends, and to fully appreciate Susan's big laugh and smile and Bill's dry and keen sense of humor. Susan's strong devotion to family was especially evident in the care of her Aunt Mick in St. Louis. Mick, or Martha as we called her, lived to the age of 97, and for the last 13 years of her life, Susan was her closest relative. The kindness Susan showed and the love and care she provided were inspiring. Susan and Bill became frequent visitors to St. Louis to look after Martha and ensure she was safe and receiving the proper care. I'm sure it wasn't always easy to manage everything from afar or always convenient to make the frequent trips. 
Susan did all this with her usual big smile and laugh and good grace. Susan's passing leaves a big hole in our small family and we will miss her. To Bill, Larissa, Tim, Stacy, and Isla, I am sending much love from your St. Louis family. Good afternoon from Shelburne, Vermont. My name is Mary Knuth Otto, and I've known Sue and Bill too since we started college together at Grinnell in 1959. I've written a letter to Sue, and I would like to share it with you now. Dear Sue, over the many years since we were at Grinnell together, we often kept in touch by letter. When you and Bill were in the Peace Corps, and David and I were organizing our visit to you in Kenya in 1968, or when you two lived in Long Valley and we planned visits to Manhattan for Philharmonic concerts. Later, when you and Bill moved to Ashland, we often communicated by email. It feels natural to write to you, even though I'm unsure of your current address and clueless about what stamp is required. Somehow, though, I know you were here with us through memory, through our long and deep connection that lasts and lasts. Remember our shared dorm at Grinnell in the fall of 1959? My room was the top of the second floor stairs, and you and Mary Haydock lived down the hall. Remember the phone kiosk and the big sheet of paper hanging next to it with its pencil dangling on a string from a thumbtack. Very soon, all of us on the hall were writing phone messages on that sheet for you that said, BC, WCB, boy called, will call back. <laughs> of course, it was Bill. You and he identified each other quickly, and your 50-some years of marriage make it obvious that you had good luck in finding each other as life partners. Our Grinnell days remain memorable, working together in student government, becoming fellow women's hall presidents, you graduating Phi Beta Kappa, both of us leaving Grinnell dedicated to doing what we could in a world filled with opportunities to serve, to find meaning, and a lot of fun too. Then there was our visit to you and Bill in Kenya that happened while you were pregnant with Larissa, when we four traveled by Land Rover, bumping across sand hills in search of ostrich, camping and cooking in the wild with our tent doors aimed at the back of the Rover in case lions should descend at night and enjoying the magic of wildebeest migrations across the Serengeti and giraffe in Maasai Mara. You were, will continue to be, a nurturing mother and inspirational woman to Larissa and Tim. Your children and Isla too will carry with them your wisdom, your devotion, your dedication to the needs of others and your love. Having both been English majors at Grinnell, we often talked about books. You introduced me to the African writers you knew from your years in the Peace Corps. The last book we talked about was Toni Morrison's Beloved when we visited you and Bill in Ashland. David and I have walked with you both as you were stifled by dementia. Bill took such good care of you. Larissa, Tim, and Isla held you close in every way they could. Their steadfast warmth and love echo yours to them and to all of us. Thank you, dear Sue, for these gifts. We are blessed to have been part of your life. Oh, 
I'm not used to having my voice amplified like that. I'm Isla, um, and I, I'm only 17, so I didn't know Sue, or as I called her, Grammy, um, for a lot of her life, but she's a wonderful person, and what I do know about her, um, I hope that I can be like her, or at least a little bit. I'm not quite as academic as she was, from what I hear, but um, um, I know that she's a very musical person. I still remember her singing, her and Grampy singing to me when I was a young and when they would come to visit. Um, and it's hard to choose a song because, you know, she had so much music throughout her life. But um, I'm going to be playing a song called Vill Vivian Williams' Waltz. Um, it's a waltz by the title. So, yeah. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge the passing of Sue Monfort, uh, who worked and volunteered for Planned Parenthood and the Center for Sex Education for more than 30 years, dating back to the 1970s. Sue was a frequent presenter at these conferences, and if you've ever used a lesson plan from the teaching guide, Unequal Partners or Making Sense of Abstinence, then Sue has made an impression in your sex education efforts. Let's take a moment of silence to remember Sue Montfort and her contributions to sex education. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me be here as part of Sue's Celebration of Life. Um, I can recall being at those conferences because I worked with Sue in the last part of her years at Planned Parenthood. And it's really an honor to be here and to hear everyone talking because a lot of what you're saying really echoes with me too. Um, I know Sue as a mentor and a friend. I'm not sure she would have called herself a mentor. I feel like that would have been too distinguished for her to have said. Um, I imagine she would have seen us as learning and growing from each other, but the truth for me is that's who she is to me. 
before I met her, after I started working along with her, and even now, and I hope that remains. Before I met Sue, she was already impacting me as a sexual health educator, even though I was at a different Planned Parenthood and didn't even know her. Her books, such as Unequal Partners, Teaching About Power and Consent in Adult Teen and Other Relationships and Teaching Safe for Sex, co-authored with Piggy Brick, right over there on that table, um, they helped me as a new sexual health educator. Their lessons were easy to understand and follow, an initial roadmap for providing sexual health education. The content and activities helped me provide age-appropriate, medically accurate sessions. Eventually, my confidence grew enough to adapt lessons, sometimes combining different activities from those books, and also leading me to create my own lessons to meet the needs of learners. I inadvertently learned about lesson writing from Sue because of the continuity of how her lessons were written with objectives and descriptions of the lessons and the steps for the lesson activities and processing questions. She was so great at processing questions. It wasn't just about the activity, it was what you learned through the experience. In 2003, I was fortunate to meet Sue directly as a new education team member with what was called the Center for Family Life Education, now known as the Center for Sex Education at Planned Parenthood of Greater Northern New Jersey. I was so excited and nervous to meet her. She introduced herself. I can hear her voice in my head, hello, I'm Sue, and proceeded to be warm and welcoming, expressing happiness to meet me and work along with her as a new team member. I would come to learn that her warmth, welcoming, and kind appreciation for others was Sue to her core. By the time I worked with Sue, she had already accumulated a lifetime of experiences as an educator and trainer with Planned Parenthood beginning in 1974. She was patient, kind, and grounded. As I spent time with her, I learned that she was super resilient, surviving multiple affiliate mergers and working in the field of sexuality and sexual health before the mandate permitting sex education in New Jersey even existed. She had a long history of providing programming with people across the lifespan in varying settings, such as health centers, a state prison, schools, and substance abuse treatment centers, just to name a few. After she retired in 2013, I was still learning about her and about her experiences designing and implementing a peer education program for women that was a source of pride for her. One of the pictures that Bill provided up in the PowerPoint. Sue was part-time with Planned Parenthood when I met her. <laughs> part-time. <laughs> Despite being part-time, she was still doing community-based education with youth and adults, traveling around the nation, providing training to professionals to be also equipped to provide sexuality education, and writing publications with Bill Tavener, like Making Sense of Abstinence. I can remember them fondly working on that publication in the affiliate at the time, and teaching Safer Sex Volumes 1 and 2. Sue was meticulous in preparing for trainings and writings. The first time I read one of her training outlines, I was amazed at how much detail and intentionality went into preparation. Alongside her outline were notes and additional process questions focused on the impact of the activity, the impact. Reflecting back, I realized Sue was first in mentoring me about the importance of thinking through the purpose of an education activity and becoming aware of how that impact would be on our learners, especially through observation and process questions in training and education, well before I learned it more formally in professional development training and classes. Days when Sue was in the office were my true favorite. Each day was a gift because I wasn't sure how much time I'd have with her. Sue had already lived that lifetime as a sexuality educator, educator trainer, and author before me. I am fortunate I was with her in the last part of it before she retired. Seeing Sue and spending time with her are among my fondest memories at Planned Parenthood. I was blessed to be in the presence of her kindness, compassion, and wisdom. I am grateful at the opportunity to get to know her, to learn from her, and learn alongside of her. She was always willing to share her honest feedback and packaged it in the best ways. She led with so much intentionality and labored over language, which I really appreciated. Sue was a beautiful soul with a huge heart. I relished being able to talk about sexuality, family, and quilting with her. I was also a quilter and we used to talk about quilting a lot. 
Her smile and her winks, she used to have like a special wink she would do, and her dove chocolate, she would bring in special dove chocolates into the office, and we would look forward to be one of the educators that would get it, and her spiced pecans, which we were talking about this weekend as well, were awesome. She was great at engaging in meta metacognitive conversations, and they were truly the best. I miss those times, and I am missing them even more now. I want to thank the family. I want to thank you, Bill, and Larissa, and Tim, and Stacy and Isla for sharing her with us. I am also touched by knowing her and working alongside her directly. And I want to thank you for letting me be here today. I knew Sue and Bill from Roof, and so it's been these later years. And all I can say is what a beautiful relationship. I knew Bill very well because we both belong to the Alzheimer's support group. And um, I know Sue had a great sense of humor, so I hope she doesn't mind that I have a, a couple of little things here about Bill that you might find interesting. <laughs> Um, so, um, <laughs> too late, Bill. He, he should have known better than to ask me to come up here. But um, so, um, in the in the support group, which is a, just a wonderful, wonderful gift to have, um, Bill was saying how that once Sue had to go into the memory care center, it was very difficult to keep track of clothing. You know, and that he went in one day and he saw uh, this bra that was a size 42 quadruple D. And that wasn't Sue. And um, so I said, Bill, he should be able to figure out who that belonged to. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I, he, I not, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. I think it was the woman in the wheelchair. Oh, well. Oh, well. Um, we also, we went traveling together and Bill and Sue and Diane and I, we went to Arizona and uh, it was uh, a wonderful trip that they had taken many times. And once we had uh, gotten there, uh, Bill had made arrangements to, um, to get a car and to drive us around and things like that. And when we went to pick it up, it was this, it was this huge black car with very dark tinted windows and it immediately became the pimp mobile. <laughs> and uh, we would tease him about that, and, and Sue laughed about that too, so we, we enjoyed, and we, we had a good time with that. I, I, my knowledge of Sue is more of a feeling than a personal connection. What warmth, what caring, what love, what presence that you can tell in people even if you're not gifted to know them for lots of years. And their relationship, I have never met a person that was more loving and caring towards his spouse. I honor them both today, and it's wonderful to see the family and to hear more about her. Let's go. 
sing together again number 1064 in the teal hymnal blue boat home this song was a favorite it's a favorite of a lot of people here at roof not only because it's a beautiful song but because what of what bill told you that sue loved to sail that she learned as a child and a youth at summer camp first as a camper, then as a counselor. And it just became a part of who she was and what she loved. So as we sing, I know I will see Sue's smiling face in my mind's eye, joyfully sailing, leaning over the edge in wonder as she makes her way through the stars shining in the infinite deep. Dear Sue, it was a joy to sail beside you for a while. Fare thee well. Will you please join me in singing? <laughs> Thank you. 
grateful for the way Sue lived her life so joyfully and in service to so many. I end this time of gathering with the words of Reverend Dr. Kendall Gibbons. There is, finally, only one thing required of us. That is to take life whole, the sunlight and the shadows together, to live the life that is given us with courage and humor and truth. We have such a little moment out of the vastness of time for all our wondering and loving. Therefore, let there be no half-heartedness. Rather, let the soul be ardent in its pain, in its yearning, in its praise. Then shall peace enfold our days and glory shall not fade from our lives. May it be so. May we live our lives fully, bringing compassion, joy, and dignity to all in Sue's honor. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. Family and friends, will you make your way to the back so that people may greet you? We are going to have um, a reception under the balcony in the back uh, for people to say hello to each other and to continue to share. Thank you so much. <laughs>